just want to start off with the injury front. Um, you know, I think uh, they're kind of milking Dylan Mahoney along, trying to see if he can bounce back. I think he's going to be out at least another two weeks. Hopefully, if things go well past the bye week, he can get an opportunity to finish the season. Um, he's been working really hard on rehab, kind of one of those those deals for those turf toes. You just don't know how quickly they're going to bounce back. Um, Tucker Yates, another guy that I think uh, if everything goes the way we want it to, hopefully we'll be able to get him back right after the bye week. And then uh, Johnny D'Agostino in practice on uh, on Wednesday, um, kind of tweaked his knee a little bit. Um, had an MRI initially, not quite sure. There's, uh, I don't think that it's going to require surgery, but I do think it may be something that's going to keep him out for four to six weeks. And so that's another one that may or may not get him back um, based on uh, based on where that's at. So that's kind of a little bit of an update there. Uh, talking about the Weaver State game, you know, kind of the recap after having an opportunity to digest it on a long bus ride home. Um, you know, probably the biggest thing for me was just uh, I felt like this was the first time where I questioned our effort as a team and was disappointed in that. And I think I really have to examine uh, what I'm doing as, a, as the head coach in terms of the psychology of this. I mean, it's obvious that We've been in a lot of really close games and we've kind of knocked on that door. And at some point in time, you have to have that breakthrough moment or there's going to be doubt that creeps into these guys' minds. And uh, when you go down 21 to nothing in the first quarter, I think that doubt was certainly present. I would say this, one of the things I pointed out to the young men yesterday was, guys, we were down 20 to nothing midway through the third quarter a week ago. That didn't change the game. And I think some of the credit goes to Weber State. I think they were executing at an extremely high level on offense. Um, and. Uh, you know, caught us in some defenses that weren't opportune at times, but we've got to we've got to counteract that with great effort. And I didn't feel like that that was something that was present for us as a team yesterday on on Saturday rather, and something that uh, we addressed yesterday. I think these guys understand it. I think that they, uh, you know, there's there's kind of three things that happen when you're going through something like we're going through right now. I think at some first first you kind of get embarrassed. You know, and uh, and that's a natural human reaction to a situation like that. And then you get angry, and then you make a change. And so I think that uh, you know we're we're kind of pushing through that part of this process right now. And uh, there's going to be moments where, gosh, it looks really good, and you you feel like you're gaining traction. And then there's going to be moments where you take a step back. And unfortunately, I think Saturday was a step back in this process. But it is part of that. And. Uh, I think it's, it was uh, probably one of the better learning moments that we had. We had a, we had a, uh, a lively session yesterday, and uh, I think the kids are going to bounce back. A lot of guys up there watching film, I think they understand that we've got a tremendous opponent coming into town that uh, is going to test us. And, uh, you know, you look at that Weaver State game, and, you, and, you, and you, you get frustrated and disappointed in some of the things that took place, but there's also a lot of positives. There's some things that I thought Chris did in the course of that game that, Gave us a chance at times. I think we're finding kind of our groove and our identity on offense, and that's really important. And uh, as we go down the stretch here, that's going to be a huge part of what we do. Um, and it's, it's kind of finding out who we can be with him as our guy, and uh, it's going to be interesting. So that's kind of the opening remarks, and we have to take questions. Were there was there anything in the second half that, that you were pleased with with the way guys played? Well, I think we, we did get a couple stops in the second half, and I think that was important. I thought we made it, we made kind of a really minor adjustment in terms of our alignment on the defensive line that gave us an opportunity to match the surface a little bit better. They're in those two tight end sets, and they get it, they trade both tight ends to one side, and we needed to just identify that and move into that a little bit more. And I thought the guys did a better job of that. Um, you know, offensively, there was just there's some moments where you're just going, man, we're we got a chance to be pretty good here especially because of the element that Chris adds with his ability to escape the pocket. Things break down, he can take off. He's faster than any defensive lineman in this league. And uh, when he gets on the edge, he can, he can create some problems for people. And I did like seeing him push the ball down the field vertically. I thought it was nice to see Keon step up and make a play. And I think that's going to give him some confidence and we can build on that. And at the end of the game, when Cam goes up and makes a play, I think he's another guy that we've just kind of been trying to work into some of these roles. and, and uh, and their practice habits have improved to the point now where you have some confidence in them as coaches. And, and I thought those guys did some decent things in the second half. And um, I thought our offensive line did a good job of, of kind of working the interior there. We still have some edges issues in terms of the pass rush. And so we've got to be smart about getting the ball out of our hand and moving the pocket at times. But, um, you know, there's, there's certainly some positives. It's nice to see Kevin Cassis go compete and make a play on the punt return. And that was kind of the point at the end there. Uh, you know, in terms of taking that time out, was, you know, we're, we're not going to quit. Let's go see if we can put one more in. 
and uh, it was a, it was an opportunity for us to practice the situation, and uh, so that there were some there were some positive things in the second half. There. You mentioned those young guys, the receivers. Is, is it just is it just a matter of practice habits for those guys? I mean, how have they been able to kind of break into rotation these last? Well, you, you know, both those young men redshirted a year ago, and so really didn't have uh, um, weren't used to game week preparation. It was kind of read a card and go make plays. And uh, you know, heck, if we could bring cards into the huddle, we'd probably be a lot better off. But uh, that's uh, that's kind of what their mode was, and so really understanding how um, how to prepare to know what's going on and. Um, I think one of the things that's helped those guys, quite honestly, is uh, as, as Chris has kind of emerged, we've had to shrink some of our drop back passing concepts, and I think that that's actually benefited us overall as a team because it's simplified some things. And uh, those guys are in a position right now as young players where, you know, simple is better for them. And they do have some natural skills. I think both those guys have bright futures here. And uh, we just, uh, I think, have been able to streamline some things for them. And to their credit, they're taking some more responsibility and accountability in terms of how they're preparing. Jeff, what makes Eastern Washington so good? Well, I think it's a combination of things. Uh, you know, I don't think it's any one thing in particular. It's kind of everything in general. You can tell there's a really strong culture of winning there. Uh, they, they play with a great deal of detail. You watch their hand placement on things. You watch how these guys compete, regardless of the game situation. I think Coach Baldwin and his staff have been there for a long time together. There's a great deal of continuity there. I think there's a tremendous commitment to the football program from the university and the administration. And you see that over the investments that they've made in keeping their coaches there and uh, enhancing their facilities and the contracts that they have with Adidas and things like that. I think that's a big piece of it that drives the, the program pretty significantly. Um, I think that they have really good players. And I think one of the things that helps Eastern is they're in a really good situation in terms of recruiting. They, you look at most of the rosters from the west side of the state of Washington, and there's really nobody competing with them for those, that level of players. You know, The Mountain West doesn't recruit really strongly in the I-5 corridor. And so it's kind of Pac-12 or Big Sky, and Eastern's a really good option. And uh, they do a nice job of really targeting that area. Uh, I know I'm familiar with a lot of guys on the roster because I was a Western Washington recruiter at, at, at the University of Washington. And so I knew about a lot of these guys, and they were, they were guys that were maybe just a step below what we were looking for at the Pac-12 level, but they've done a good job of developing. And you look at a guy like Cooper Cup, obviously, I mean, his dad played at Washington. And, and uh, I think his grandfather's on the on the All American wall there, and, and uh, that's a guy that was missed. He was a walk on in Eastern Washington. He's from AC Davis High School in Yakima, Washington, and um, he might be the best receiver I've seen on film in five years. And uh, and I'm just talking about I'm not talking about just catching the ball. You watch this guy when he's away from the ball. His route running, way he blocks. Um, He's a, he's, a, he's a pro right now, and so I think those are, you know, that, that drives a lot of the things. You look at, you think Cooper Cup's good, look at some of the guys around him. Well, one of the reasons those guys are all so good collectively is I'm sure they push each other. I'm sure there's a great deal of competition within that receiving core, and I think those things all together create a tremendous program, and that's why I really believe it. You know, I mean, I'm watching them go toe for toe, blow for blow with North Dakota State on tape, and I'm not sure if that game's played in Cheney. That's not a game that they don't win. And so they're very close to being a six and zero team, who's already beat one of the best twelve, one of the best teams in the Pac-12 North, and uh, offensively might be as good a team as I've seen, uh, just in terms of how they execute and operate. You've got a quarterback who's completing over seventy percent of his passes. You've got three receivers that are right around hundred yards per game, I and mean, you got, I mean, Cooper Cup six two two fifteen. Now this guy is strong. You know, they throw a post against UC Davis. The guy's got him covered. He goes up one handed catch and then just throws the guy off of him and goes for another 60 yards for a touchdown. I mean, he is strong. The guys at Washington State had a very difficult time getting him on the ground. He's got 712 receiving yards and seven touchdowns. You know, you got Shaq Hill, 522 yards and eight touchdowns. And you got the Bowman kid, uh, 44 receiving sections, 612 yards, three touchdowns. And you got three guys that are averaging right around 100 yards receiving a game. You add the end to that. The quarterback, I think, is a game changer for them on offense because instead of just being an air raid style where you're getting into, you know, just it's all get the ball out of your quick hands quick, get the ball to the athletes on the perimeter, this guy is a legitimate quarterback run threat. Um, they run a lot of design quarterback runs, which adds another de 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 element to it. So instead of just having to leverage him and pass rush, now you've got to worry about him as a runner. So you pick your poison. You're going to match drop to try to take care of all these great receivers they have and open up run lanes underneath, or 
Or are you going to try to pressure him and let him get one-on-one -on -one coverage on guys like those three receivers we just talked about? You talked about being <coughs> this weekend be a step in the right direction for this program where it's at right now? Um, it's kind of a loaded question, John. I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, a, it's a measuring stick for us for how far we've got to go. I mean, it's, uh, it's a senior-laden team. You have three All-American receivers. You have a quarterback, although he's a sophomore, he's a redshirt sophomore. He's been in the system for three years. Defensively, which is maybe the biggest improvement that I see on Eastern's team, uh, they're, they're a senior-laden veteran outfit. And so I think that they've taken the next step, even though they're giving up points and yards. Heck, they're going to have to play a lot of snaps with the style they play on offense. You know, that's just the nature of what they do. Bo made that decision a long time ago. You know, you don't want to be a defensive coordinator for Bo because your numbers are going to have to be very good. But you're going to win a lot of games because you're going to have, you're going to have an offense that can score. And so they need that five, five stops a game. If they get five stops a game, they're in pretty good shape. And I, I, think that they've, I think that they've really improved, especially in the front seven. Defensively, and so for us, you know, we've got to improve. We've got to improve, you know, in terms of um, our practice habits, in terms of our focus, in terms of the level of intensity that we have to compete at to uh, to give ourselves a chance. I think you, you know, the best example that I'll give you is we had a fourth quarter, we had a fourth down stop against UND. Okay, Josh Hill's helmet goes popping off. The the sheer joy, the emotion. The passion in that moment right there compared that to the fourth down stop we had in the third quarter against the Weber State. That's who we have to, that's how we have to play. We have to play out of our minds in terms of the level of effort, focus, and intensity to have a chance to compete. Because uh, you know we've got some deficiencies, and that's that's the reality of it. That doesn't mean that we can't win games. And we've got to we've got to find a way to put our kids in a better opportunity than we did this last Saturday. When you look at a guy like Cooper, I mean for four years. Inevitably, defenses have tracked every day against him. What is your view on how you not stop him, but at least try to contain yeah, well, him? Well, and I think part of the problem is the other guys are so good, too. Yeah. So if you want to load your coverage to that side, or you want to bracket him, or you want to run star coverage, then you got to deal with the other two guys, or three or four, or whoever else they throw out there. Or if you want to, like I said, be in a max drop mode, you know, Northern Colorado kind of did that, played basically on umbrella coverage, and, uh, you know, they, they just ran ball. And so, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, he's done it to everybody. He did it to us three years ago at Washington. I mean, he went off on us, and I'm going, who is this guy? And uh, now I know. <laughs> and so, I mean, I don't know what the numbers were he had against Washington State. You know, you got a cook in the house. What did, what did he, how many did he throw for, catch for in that game? Uh, like 286 yards of total offense or something? A lot. Yeah. yeah. He had 12 for 12. 12, 12, 12 yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then he had they ran sweeps with him and, and he threw the ball once. I mean, he was like, you know, 11 on one. And so, um, yeah, I mean, he's a tremendous player. And I think the coolest thing about him is this is a guy who has a total chip on his shoulder. Nobody recruited him. Not even Eastern gave him a scholarship until he went in that day. And uh, you know now he's being discussed as maybe one of the highest round draft picks in recent years out of the FCS, and I think deservedly so. I mean, I, you, like I said, it's not just him catching the ball, and then he pulls away from guys. You, know, you watch him play against East, Oregon State, Washington, Washington State over the years, the Pac-12 opponents that he's played against. He, you know, the speed is not a factor. I mean, he's fast enough, and he's strong. He runs great routes, and he's a tremendous blocker. I mean, there's some little detailed things that you notice on film that you're like, that is impressive, and so. Uh, really think a lot of him, but I think it's, you know, I don't think that yeah, there's a lot of drop-off between him and those other guys. I think there's great competition in that room. I think one thing that's really helped them this year, you know, uh, they have a new offensive coordinator. I don't know if Bo's still calling plays or if Troy Taylor's calling plays, but Troy was uh, Jake Browning's high school football coach at Folsom High School. And I've known Jake, I've known Troy for a long time. He kind of actually didn't get into coaching for a while. He was a color guy for Cal Radio for a long time and uh, taught at Folsom High School. And was kind of the quarterback guru in Sacramento, and I recruited that area. And so I got to know Troy, and Troy's a really smart guy. And I, you can kind of see his, the kind of the wrinkles that he's put on this offense, the four by one empty stuff, a little bit more stuff in the run game. And so um, I think that was a, that's been a good addition for him. It's kind of been something that was good for their program at that point in time, is to add somebody new to the staff because they've been there so long together. It kind of creates some, maybe some new excitement and some new ideas. One of those new ideas is the quarterback run. They so much more quarterback run with since Troy came aboard. How do you slow that down while also taking care of all the? Well, they're going to get their yards. I'm just going to tell you right now. 
they're going to get their yards and they're going to score points because they do it against everybody. It doesn't matter, you know, who it is. They find a way to operate. And uh, so I think, you know, what, we, what you have to do is you've got to tackle in space. You can't let them catch slants and go eight. You can't let them, you know, run their quarterback power and crease you for 60. You know, hey, a first down, that's all right. Let's make them line up and do it all the way down the field. And then you got to be smart and calculated in terms of uh, if you choose to pressure them and how and when you do that. What benefit does Chris get by playing an entire game um, under center and sort of seeing start to finish? Yeah, I think it's just reps. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's just banked reps, get an opportunity to play. And that's, it's hard to improve if you don't play. And, uh, you know, that, those opportunities for him are really, really valuable right now. Um, as I mentioned to Jay yesterday, you know, there's, there's four to seven plays a game where you're just like, what in the world are you thinking? You know, I'm 46 years old and played linebacker, and I can tell that's where I'm supposed to go with the ball, you know. And, uh, and then there's four to ten plays a game where you're like, I'm glad he's out there because I don't know that we can get a first down if his legs don't get it for you. Or, you know, he sees something and gets rid of the ball and makes a play. And so I think that it's just about those, the more he plays, the fewer of those, those what do you thinking plays happen and more of those that's pretty awesome plays happen. And I think that there's a... Um, He's a confident, relaxed, calm kid, and uh, I think he's learning that that preparation part is really important. You know, because I'm not sure that at Lawndale High School he didn't just go out there and they'd snap the ball and he'd run around and somebody was opening throw it to him or just run away from everybody. And um, the cool thing about Chris is he really is a student of the game. He likes football, and you ask him questions. You know, sometimes it's interesting in the recruiting process. You have conversations like, "Hey, tell me about your favorite football player." No, him and Holland. You know, and when somebody pulls out, you know. I really like watching Peyton Manning, but my guy's Michael Vick, and you know who's even you know even more in the moon. You know, I mean, he's that type of guy. But he'll even rewind wind it back to guys that no one ever even remembers. So, which is awesome. <laughs> Did you see a change in his demeanor at all when uh, as, as preparing to be the starter when he was named the starter? Not really. He's always kind of the same, which is a really good quality. Um, probably felt it a little bit more, maybe you know, as we led up to game time, but you know. He still operated pretty well. We've got, you know, I mean, he's turned the ball over too many times. I'm going to be smart about that. The, uh, the pass to Jayshon was pretty impressive. Um, did he, you think he showed what he can do specifically as a, as a thrower at quarterback? Well, the thing that I want to see him do is get the ball out of his hands quicker. You know, it, it, because I think he's, and part of that is processing information. It's like, okay, am I going here? Am I going here? Am I going here? We can help him with that. By, by condensing and saying, you go here to here to run. And, uh, you know, that's something that's probably going to be good for him for a while. But I think that, you know, he's, he's made some throws all the way back in fall camp. I remember when I thought he was, when I was like, this guy's not bad. You know, we have pretty simple, quick game concept. Certain set of routes to this side, certain set of routes to this side. He goes one, two, no, comes all the way back and puts a slam on Kevin Cassis. And I was like, that's not bad. Now, that the game's that he's not going, it's not rookies on rookies, it's it's varsity football, so to speak, that's, uh, it's got to happen that much quicker. And I think he, every opportunity he gets, that those reps uh, allow him to process that information faster and make decisions faster. You mentioned, so, <clears throat> you mentioned the style of Eastern plays defensively. How, how do you think you match up with what they're doing, especially since they try to take the ball away like they do? Yeah. Well, they, <coughs> it's probably the most I've ever studied them on defense, you know, because we played in the Washington State when I was there. I was watching their offense. We played them in Washington when I was there. I was watching their offense. Um, but you just look at numbers and you know that they've struggled stopping people in the past. And so what I see is I, I see a better defensive line than I thought they would have. And I think that that's um, some of its maturity. They've got some guys that have played a lot of football there. I like their inside linebacker number four. I think he's a really good player. Um, you know, they, they kind of rotate some dudes up front. That, that defensive end, buck linebacker, they're playing more 3 4 than I've seen them play. And I think that that's an influence of maybe them going out and doing some homework and changing some things. They look a lot like Washington. That's, I think that's who they've clinicked with, if, uh, if you were asking me. Um, that they're running more max coverage stuff, and, and uh, they've kind of got that guy. I can remember his name. Number three is, uh, that's his name. Anybody remember his name? The safety number three. No, he's the he's stand up outside the line. Oh, Hickey like Bomb. Block. 
Yeah, Samson. And him. he's, uh, you know, he's he's a guy that's different than most guys in this league. I mean, he's got some real life twitch off the edge. Uh, even against NDSU, they were having to chip their way out with him, and uh, he can create a lot of problems. And so, I think that they're that's that's the thing I see. I think they they've got a lot of veteran guys. They play the Hadili kid, Fiuli. Uh, they kind of got their poly crew inside there that does a good job. Number three is a problem in pass rush. He, he, that's a, that's a matchup issue. You're gonna have to you're gonna have to dedicate somebody more than just one guy to him in a lot of situations. Uh, Bruce, veteran safety, playing a lot of ball for him, and then uh, the Zamora kid from Federal Way, who's got every day and once. And so they compete really hard. You know, I mean, you can tell. I mean, they probably you know they're probably not winning a lot of those one on ones, but they're competing against really really good talent, and so that's going to elevate their level of of, uh, of competition as well. Special teams wise, they put a couple of young kids back there as returners. Play pretty um, well. You know they got, they got the, they do. They rotate some guys yeah. back there, but they'll put Cooper Cup back there when the game's on the line, and you got uh, Shaq back there returning kickoffs. And so I think, uh, I think it kind of depends. I mean, I think they're trying to maybe get, especially in home games, they play a few more guys, which is natural. They play a lot of running backs, um, and some of those guys will go back and return kicks for them. But uh, you know, I think they're very. Uh, they have good team speed, so that, that's always problematic in a kicking game, and that's one of the things that, uh, that we've got to improve here is our team speed so that we can match up with some of those. But uh, I think by and large, you know, we've done a, we've done a reasonably good job of, of covering kicks and putting ourselves in position, you know, really with the exception of the Idaho game and their punter was the difference in that. I think we won the battle of field position when we look at the end of the game and we look at the numbers, I think we've done that in every game except the Idaho game. Defensively for you guys, you saw uh, a lot of rotation again, but it looked like even almost a platoon type system in the front seven. What, uh, what's the strategy behind that? Well, when you have six guys, you try to keep them fresh. And so uh, with those guys to play more than five or six snaps at a time at a high level is going to be a struggle. And so we've just, uh, I think Byron's done a good job of kind of trying to keep those guys and keep them coming in and out. And, um, we've got to try to match it up a little bit based on down and distance and situation. And, the hard thing is, is when you get to that situation, it's like I really like this guy in the game on third down. If we can get to, to that, because you know we struggle creating a lot of pass rush, and only have a couple guys we feel like can do that for us. And so, um, but if they played eight plays in a row, you still got to sub them, and so um, that creates some problems for us. But we're working through that. And got a heck of a challenge here this week. Chad, no, is he feeling okay? Yeah, you know, Chad. He's kind of this kind of been the same thing for the last month, basically. You know, I mean, he's got a bone bruise, and so you know, he, he's a tough kid and he handles it. But he's sore on Sunday and, and works his way through it. And usually by by Thursday, Friday, he's feeling pretty good. Do you expect John Walker to be back in the starting lineup? This yeah. Time? yeah, I do. The commissioner talk, has talked recently about the likelihood of a nine game yeah the schedule being implemented for 2020. What are your Thoughts, well, I'm thinking I better win some games if I want to be around here in 2020. But uh, <laughs> that's uh, that's my first response. It doesn't really matter who we play. I mean, I'm sure there's some, the biggest issue I see is is being able to have a six-game home schedule. I think that's obviously the biggest issue that you got to work around is figuring out how are you going to be able to bring quality opponents in here. And if you're playing a nine-game nine-game conference schedule and you only have two open dates, that kind of makes it hard for you to play. Unless you're in a 12-year season, you can't really play a, a, an FBS opponent, which is a downside. I think our guys, I like playing those games, and I think our guys would like playing those games. And so it reduces your opportunities to play a, an FBS opponent. And then uh, in certain years, it's going to be tough to get a six-game home schedule. The 12, a 12-game 12 schedule, would you be completely opposed I, to I, I, No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Um, I think we've got to look at it. Here's the thing I find immediately. There's two things that I think jump out to me in my in my infancy in FCS football as a head coach. Number one, we have fewer scholarships, and I know that's I knew that going in. But how that affects your roster depth, and the longer the season goes, the more you're seeing these guys get get beat up. And uh, I don't know that that's good for the players. The other thing is, and I know this sounds crazy. I'm guessing that this is probably pretty problematic at a lot of places of this size. We don't have as many class offerings. And so our our kids' schedule, our meeting schedule and our practice schedule is kind of all over the place. You know, we've got to bring guys in at 6 o'clock in the morning to do position meetings because they've got a 2.30 lab. And, and because there's not as many course offerings, that kind of, that, that really hamstrings you a little bit too in that regard. 
and I think that just those long days start to wear on our guys as the season wears on. Um, when you're at a, at a Power 5 place and there's 40,000 undergrads and they offer 16 sections of English 101, you know, you can get those guys kind of in where, where you need them. And here we have some limited options in that regard. So um, outside of being able to do everything in the morning, which isn't realistic for us right now, um, I think that would be the one thing that would help us. And I think that, I know that doesn't, you wouldn't think that that would impact a 12 game schedule, but the bottom line is, I mean, you know, their, their gas tanks are full in August, and when you get to November, they're pretty low between, you know, burning the candles at both ends of meetings and preparation and coursework, and um, that's something I think we got to pay attention to.